Hi, everybody. We're just waiting for everybody to log on. Um, and we are also streaming on Facebook Live. Uh, I am Ari Engel, the Director of Creative Community for Peace. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we thank all of you who have supported and given us great feedback for all these sessions. Uh, they really have been amazing and the support has been great. For all of you who don't know, Creative Community for Peace is a nonprofit entertainment industry organization comprised of prominent members of the entertainment community who have come together to promote the arts as a bridge to peace. Additionally, we are the leading organization in working to counter anti-Semitism within the entertainment industry, in addition to galvanizing support against the cultural boycott of Israel. Some of our recent work includes engaging with digital platforms such as TikTok and Spotify to ensure better monitoring of these sites for anti-Semitic content. Uh, through the years, we have also provided guidance and support to artists such as Alicia Keys, Rihanna, Bon Jovi, and many more when they come under attack from boycott activists when they book shows to play in Israel. To learn more about our work and support us, please visit ccfpeace.com. Once again, ccfpeace.com or creativecommunityforpeace.com. We are a nonprofit organization, so we do rely on donations. Uh, we have a very important panel event for everyone today discussing the resurgence of anti-Semitism. Just 75 years after the Holocaust and the murder of over 6 million Jews, unfortunately, anti-Semitism is once again spreading around the globe. As it continues to shape shift and take many new forms, uh, the world's oldest conspiracy theory just refuses to die. Uh, American Jews thought it would never truly reach our shores, but as the Anti-Defamation League reported just this past week, there were more than 2,100 anti-Semitic incidents in the United States in 2019, which is a 12% increase and the most incidents in any year since the ADL began tracking four decades ago. Similarly, the Community Security Trust Organization in the UK reported over 1,800 incidents in 2019 in the UK, constituting a 7% increase and the fourth consecutive year the figure has reached a new high. We also saw a report coming out of Germany where they saw a 12% increase last year as well. And we have seen similar rises in Canada, most of Europe and uh, international institutions where the Jewish state unfortunately has become the Jew of the states. For all of those joining us in Zoom, you can leave questions in the Q&A section and we'll get to many of them as possible. Uh, to briefly introduce our panelists, first we have Yair Rosenberg, who is a senior writer at Tablet Magazine where he covers the intersection of politics, culture, and religion, along with being an expert on anti-Semitism. His work has appeared in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, and The Guardian, and his writings have received rewards from the Religion News Writers Association and the Harvard Center for Jewish Studies. Yair also just finished up an album of classic Jewish songs, which is coming out soon. Hi, Yair. Uh, next, we have Ancho Pfeffer, who has covered Israeli politics, anti-Semitism, and global affairs for two decades. He is a senior correspondent and columnist for Haaretz, the Israeli correspondent for The Economist, and a contributor to The Guardian. Anshul is also the author, uh, is also an author whose latest book, Bibi, The Turbulent Life and Times of Benjamin Netanyahu, has received critical acclaim. Hi, Anshul. And finally, our moderator for the discussion today is Amy Spiro. Amy formerly covered pop culture and the cultural boycott uh, of Israel for the Jerusalem Post. She is now the digital editor and Jerusalem correspondent at the Jewish Insider. And with that, I now turn it over to you, Amy. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks to both of you for joining us today. Um, so we are here to talk about anti-Semitism. We are in the middle of a global pandemic and you know, those two are not unrelated at this moment. Um, you know, Yair, can you, maybe tell me a little bit about some of like the most disturbing things that we, you know, anti-Semitic incidents we've seen really related to, to the ongoing health crisis. So first of all, I just wanna thank everyone who took the time out of their day uh, to come to this. Um, it's not the most uplifting source material, but it is important. Uh, so I appreciate everyone who came. Um, so when you have anything, you know, so when any sort of disaster strikes uh, anywhere in the world, it could be a terrorist attack, it could be man-made, it could be natural like uh, a pandemic. Um, there's only a matter of time uh, before somebody finds a way to pin it on um, Jews or undesirable minority communities, whatever those might be. Um, there's a little uh, phrase that I like to call it the Goebbels gap, which is the amount of time between something bad happening in the world 
and somebody figuring out a way to pin it on the Jews. Um, and we've seen this all the time. And of course, we saw it with the coronavirus. Um, my old uh, boss, Walter Russell Mead, who's a columnist at the Wall Street Journal, has a wonderful column that you guys can look up. Uh, where he just goes through, uh, like across the map in different countries, different groups of people blaming the virus on the Jews. Sometimes it's on the state of Israel. Sometimes it's on the Rothschilds or some, you know, wealthy Jewish family. Um, there have been, you know, attempts to link it to George Soros, uh, which some of you may have seen. Um, and so what, what's going on here is, of course, is that when people are frightened and confused and they want someone uh, to blame for something that there isn't really anyone to blame, uh, they will try to find some like hidden hand. Uh, and there is this long, you know, centuries worth of material uh, about Jews being that hidden hand. So you're only a few Google searches away. Um, and that's how you end up with this sort of thing. So that's the most obvious kind uh, of anti-Semitism. Um, you've had a couple other things. One is you may have seen the, and this is not unique to the Jewish community, but the phenomenon of Zoom bombing, which is when abusive users get a hold of the link uh, to something like this, or to uh, more uh, to say an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, or a synagogue meeting, or a mosque uh, getting together uh, for Ramadan. Uh, and they jump in and they start blasting slurs or pornography or something else in order to disrupt the gathering. Um, and this is the sort of thing that just, you know, the internet has always had, but now people are online has replaced real life. And so this sort of abusive behavior from the internet is seeping into real life. Um, and then finally, uh, something that I think is not as uh, noticed, uh, but is definitely, I think, an anti-Semitic phenomenon worth noting, is that uh, the way people reacted to uh, how cor coronavirus arriving in Israel in the Middle East um, reflected certain prejudices people had about Jews. And so when Israel had its first fatality from the coronavirus, um, you saw a significant outpouring on social media, including some people with real profiles, uh, sort of saying, let's go, or you know, cheering it on. And of course, that looked particularly bad at the time, and it looked even worse when the first fatality turned out to be an 88-year-old Holocaust survivor. Um, and, you know, people sometimes will get to this, but people sometimes have trouble disentangling anti-Israel from anti-Semitic, but cheering on the deaths of random civilians in a country because you have a political issue with it uh, is, you know, the sort of thing that we could, I think, we consider prejudice. Yeah. Uh, Anshel, you know, obviously the Jewish community in England and London has also been hit very hard by the coronavirus, like in New York. Um, have you seen this sort of anti-Semitism cropping up around that in any way, or has it been, you know, very different from New York in that respect? Well, I'm uh, currently in Israel, so I haven't really been right. following that close to what's happening back in London uh, or in other parts of Britain on the ground. I think there have been similar occurrences to what uh, Yair has, uh, has, has just uh, described. And I think also a lot of this is what's happening is happening on social media and therefore it's not really a geo phenomenon. These people are uh, cheering when uh, when a Holocaust survivor in Israel passes away of COVID-19. It's it like, it very likely people from many places around the world, not necessarily Britain or, or the United States. I think actually we're probably seeing it less in places like Britain, the United States, because of the kind of uh, um, lack of respectability that overt anti-Semitism has today in places like that. And, you know, if, if we can really trace and some some there are some people who actually take the you know take, make the effort to trace where where some of these social the social media accounts are coming from, they'll be coming from places like like Russia and other places today. Where uh, both where anti-Semitism is is less uh, is more respectful, is more respectable, more acceptable in society, and very often it's not coming from the places where where, you know, where most Western Jews live and uh, and circulate, and, and and I think that uh, that one one of the one of the disasters of social media is that every idiot sitting in a in a basement suddenly has. This platform of millions, and we should, you know, we should, we should, we should keep that in perspective. Uh, not to take away any of the importance of the things that Yair has just uh, uh, described now, but our main problem today is not overt anti-Semitism of that type, which you know we can see coming a thousand miles away. We know, we know who these people are. We, you know, we know what they represent. We know what they are, and they're not the real danger today, because the real danger are much more veiled, much more nuanced. Types of anti-Semitism. Not the kind of person who's like, yeah, yeah, a Holocaust survivor just died of Corona. That's, you know, that's the kind of thing that we know we know how to deal with, and we can 
I won't say ignore, but we can put it in perspective when it happens on social media. Right. Um, you know, uh, Ari mentioned uh, in the intro that we've seen, you know, recent reports come out about the amount of anti-Semitism uh, in 2019 in the UK, the Community Security Trust put it out, the, the ADL put out a report. This is the highest figure since they've started keeping track, uh, I think around 40 years ago. Um, you know, do, should we expect this trend to continue? I mean, what are we seeing that this is continuing to rise at such a degree and what, what should we be expecting for this year? Yeah, here if you wanna answer this one. <laughs> Yeah, because no one, no one wants to step on somebody else in the Zoom. Um, yeah, so if you look at the historical trends uh, surrounding anti-Semitism that the ADL picks up and that some other organizations have over the years, and say the FBI's hate crime statistics uh, against Jews. Um, so one thing you'll see in, say, those FBI statistics is that if you add up all the religiously motivated hate crimes in America, um, the Jews are more than everybody else combined, despite being only 2% of the American population. Uh, so on the one hand, that's pretty bad. Uh, on the other hand, if you look how many of those crimes there actually are, uh, it's not a huge number. Um, but the thing that you see is that the trends go up and they go down. Um, and so you have this, if you look at these statistics, you have this like sort of weird spike um, during Obama's presidency, and then it drops all the way down. And then you have this spike during Trump's presidency. Um, and we'll see if it goes back down. Uh, but I'm sort of wary in general of attributing these things to very specific phenomenon right now. Uh, because if you look at the trend lines, there's sort of this baseline and it goes up and it goes down, it goes up and it goes down, but it has sort of a mean, it has sort of an average. Um, and so that on the one hand, that should be a little bit heartening because people realize it's not that, you know, current trends means they're just going to keep continuing and things will keep rising. But it also means that uh, people shouldn't kid themselves. This doesn't just go away. It's not like civilization advanced beyond this or say people see enough Holocaust movies and then they'll stop being anti-Semites, right? There is this sort of baseline of, uh, anti-Semitic sentiment in societies, including Western countries, um, that doesn't just go away uh, because we have whatever we have right now. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I, I think that one of the problems that we have today with these reports is a matter of methodology. First of all, the reports are being made by different groups, different think tanks, different organizations, which have different types of methodology. And second is that as, you know, the more and more that th things are, are become transparent because of social media, the more uh, some things which used to be, you know, people, they used to have pamphleteers sitting in their basements and looking for the, the addresses of Jews so they could send them, they could mail them uh, uh, anti-Semitic pamphlets. And now, you know, you know, now all you have to do is, is have a Twitter account. So there sometimes is a feeling that we have this deluge of anti-Semitism. And at the same time, most of us don't experience it offline you know, in our daily lives we don't we don't go around places where you know, you know where it, it's it's a part of our of our of our IRL of our in real life and not of our online Twitter or Facebook or whatever other social media platforms uh, we use so so there's a real there's a, there's a big problem of, of how you know really how to measure this nowadays now it's also brought some uh, brought some very positive things that we can look into somebody's past because quite often Someone today tries to pass themselves off as being a respectable person, someone who is a candidate for public office, who wants to be, who, who has some kind of important job in, in community, in society. And then we can go back five, six, seven, eight years ago to their Facebook or their Twitter accounts and see things that they said when they were less noticed, less, uh, less prominent. And then we can get an idea of, of, of what these people were saying about their, their, their local Jewish community, about Jews in general. And that, you know, that's, that's a very positive thing that we can have this sort of, uh, uh, of, uh, of its ability to go back in time and, and vet people. But at the same time, you know, we do have to keep this, once again, sense of proportion of where, of where things are, that the, the real number of, of, uh, of, of blatant, violent, of certainly violent and life endangering anti-Semitic situations in which a Jew in most places will find himself are, are, are pretty low. You know, we're, we're not in the same kind of danger that our great grandparents were, were 100 years ago living, even, even in the West, where it was you know, the discrimination, you know, just to you know, just to get a job or to be or to be accepted to to, to university or things, or, or things like that. Easy if you had a Jewish surname. But we're not living in that situation today. And on the other hand, we do have this experience of anti-Semitism coming into our homes 
because as we are now, we're, you know, we're watching our screens and we're seeing these things. And yeah, I mentioned even sometimes on a Zoom uh, uh, up, suddenly someone can can intrude and and give these messages. So we're we're, we're developing, I think, new mechanisms both for measuring it and I think also for dealing with it in our own personal spaces. And you know, we have to also remember who we're dealing with. Most of the time, when we're seeing the worst types of anti-Semitism, it's coming from the weakest. Uh, most marginal elements in society, so not even our own societies. It, you know, quite often the worst anti-Semitism I see online is from countries like Malaysia, Malaysia and places like that, where I haven't been. Maybe I'll go one day, but it's not somewhere where most of us find ourselves hanging out. Right. Um, you know, a lot of people who write about anti-Semitism today uh, will divide things up. We'll talk about right-wing anti-Semitism and left-wing anti-Semitism and Islamic anti-Semitism, um, you know, and talking about uh, the nation of Islam and, and black Hebrew Israelites. Do you think these divisions make sense? Are we getting a full picture when we when we divide it up in this way? Yair, if you want to start. I mean, to study any phenomenon, you have to make divisions and those sorts of distinctions. Uh, at the same time, I, I find them to be the bane of my existence uh, when talking to many different audiences about these issues, um, because people have a tendency once you start dividing these things up to start playing them off against each other and saying which one of these is worse which one of them should we care about whereas the other one we shouldn't really uh who is the exception and who is the rule and almost always everyone believes that the exception is their own community and the rule is everybody else the people they disagree with on everything politically or religiously already so if you're a democrat you're hyper attuned uh to far right uh, anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry. And all of those things are genuine and real. Um, but you come up with all sorts of uh, fascinating contortions and excuses to look away from similar stuff in your own community, sometimes of the more nuanced sort that Anshel was looking at, was mentioning earlier. Um, and he, when we talked, we reference a Jeremy Corbyn of the British Labour Party and the large anti-Semitism scandal they had over the span of many years. Um, that was only possible because there were so many excuses made for it. Um, even though it was extremely obvious what was going on to experts and to people who have studied and reported on this for a very long time. And of course, to Britain's own Jewish community, which was very vocal about what they were experiencing. Um, but that's because people are very good at spotting the flaws of their enemies and very bad at recognizing and dealing with them among their friends. Um, and that's really problematic uh, because if you think about it, where does your voice carry the most? Where do you have the most authority and ability to affect change? Um, in circles where people trust you and in places where you are part of the community. Um, so if a young Republican on campus goes over to the Intersectional Feminist Club on campus and says, you guys have to deal with the fact that there are some people in your group who, under the guise of criticizing Israel's policies, sometimes lapse into anti-Semitism, they're going to look at this Republican and laugh him out of the room, and then they'll probably get defensive about what he said because he's from the out group, right? Whereas if someone from their own group had raised that issue... Uh, internally and said, this is something we need to deal with. Um, and it's a hard conversation, but we should have it. That person might actually get listened to and might've actually changed something. But pretty much what we have right now in the, certainly in the American partisan conversation about anti-Semitism is people trying to bounce other people as anti-Semites from parties they were never even invited to. Uh, so Democrats are trying to bounce Republican anti-Semites. Republicans are trying to bounce Democratic anti-Semites. And everyone is looking very clearly away from the sorts of anti-Semitism that's going on in their own backyard. So while these distinctions are valuable, uh, I don't think they're actually practically useful because practically the only anti-Semitism you really can do anything about is the anti-Semitism in your own community where you have influence and credibility. Um, and that's where you should be focusing your attention. Anshel, do you uh, agree with your assessment? And, and do you think that maybe some of these divisions or categories are are minimized or are over covered in some ways when we when we talk about them? I don't think uh, the categories are minimized uh, if you know if, if you address them in, in an even handed way. I mean, there is a very uh, positive development in the last 10, 20 years that to be an anti semite is unacceptable. Today, in almost every Western society and, all, and increasingly in other societies as well, you can't be an open anti-Semite and hold public office or hold any other kind of, of, uh, of position, of uh, any kind of respectable position. It even goes far as the, as, the, as the leaders of the Islamic Republic of Iran who, 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 
who insist that they're not anti-Semites and look, we have a Jewish community here in Tehran and look how safe they are, therefore we are not anti-Semites. So the idea today of, of really for, with, with very few exceptions of being openly hostile to all Jews in public life, almost anywhere in the world is, is impossible. That's a great achievement. We've achieved that as Jews, I think, by, by persevering and by, you know, by, by, not, by, by not being silent and by showing what, you know, what an important part we play in both in society, and I think also Israel as a successful country has also played, played a role in making anti-Semitism less acceptable. But on the other hand, what we have seen is this increase, this creeping uh, uh, phenomenon of selective anti-Semitism whereby nobody hates Jews, but, but some Jews are good, some Jews are bad. And you know, we know all, we know all the catchphrases and, and slogans. If you're on a, in a certain place in politics, then you don't hate Jews, but you hate the Zionists. And if you in another place, and you don't hate Jews, but you hate the liberals and you hate the the cosmopolitans. And it, and people who are both on the far right and the far left all hate globalists and bankers. So you know, the, the, all these code words for Jews, they still exist. These you know, these stereotypes, these these nasty characteristics. The, the, you know, the, the talk of, of dual uh, uh, loyalty and so on, they exist both on the right and the left. But the problem is that once it's become so selective and once our politics, especially in, in, in the most recent years, have become so hyper-partisan that it's being used both as a, out of, uh, uh, out of, uh, uh, of public discourse, but also it's very difficult to fight it because there are Jews on both the sides. It's the old, that old classic of some of my best friends are Jews is now some of my closest political allies are Jews. So how can you blame me when I say I, I, I've done nothing against Jews, I only hate Zionists. Look how many anti-Zionist Jews there are. Or uh, in, the, in a much, to me, much more poignant situation, uh, far-right anti-Semites in Europe can say, how can you blame us as being anti-Semites? Look, the son of the, president, of the Prime Minister of Israel has been tweeting us appreciatively. Uh, you know, he's our ally. How can you say we're anti-Semites if the son of uh, the Prime Minister of Israel is uh, you know is our is our ally, and uh, various American politicians can say, how can you say I'm, I'm anti-Semite when my grandchildren are Jewish? Uh, so it's it's so easy now to to find Jewish uh, allies, and I think we have to both be on the watch uh, on the lookout for anti for these selective anti-Semites, but we also have to ask ourselves some very serious questions within our own Jewish communities: What's happened to our solidarity? Why? Why is it that so many Jews are capable of taking the side of anti-Semites, whether on the right or on the left, and basically damning our own fellow Jews by saying, look, you know, I'm a right winger and my friends are this government in Europe and this party in the United States. And if you're a Jew, a Jew you don't agree with me, there's something wrong with you as a Jew. And, all, and the same thing is happening on the left where people are saying, you know, we believe in tikkun olam and against racism and, and against any of um, any kind of uh, discrimination. And if you as a right-wing Jew don't agree with something wrong with you as a Jew, and I'm gonna join up with people who you think are anti-Semites. So you know, we have to somehow rediscover the, the feeling of solidarity. And I think your question was very valid, Amy, that there is the tendency sometimes to, to, to uh, minimize certain categories, but that very much depends on where you are, uh, what your partisan politics are. Right. Um, you know, to talk about that idea of selective, you know, anti-Semitism, you know, CCFP, one of the, you know, their main goal is to fight BDS and to fight people who are, you know, fueling that movement, especially in the arts community. Um, you know, do you think it's possible to say that you support BDS, but you're not anti-Semitic? Or is that just a, you know, an impossible claim? Anshel, we can start with you. I think uh, theoretically it is possible. Some people sincerely believe that uh, by boycotting Israel or Israeli goods, they may have an impact on um, on Israel's policies. And, you know, I'm, I'm against most of the current government's policies myself. I don't think that boycotts necessarily are a hugely effective way of doing that. And I do think that in, very, in many cases, what today masquerades for anti-Zionist boycotts is actually very thinly veiled or not so thinly veiled but still is behind that veil anti-semitism and, and I, I don't think it's effective either but i can't say that bds will always necessarily be an anti-semitic thing to do because it israel is a country which you can criticize and boycotts sometimes work boycotts 
you know, I, there, there are certain brands that I don't buy for various, various physical reasons myself. Boycotts can work. So mm -hmm. I, think in, I, I, I think that in many cases, uh, the, the current BDS movement does not come with, uh, you know, does not come with clean hands. This argument, and, and it in many cases, has, uh, has been barely veiled anti-Semitism or has boiled over into anti-Semitism. We've seen it. It's very difficult for them if they even try to, to, you know, to, to, to be focused on just on Israel. But theoretically, it, BDS could, it's not necessarily anti-Semitic, no. Okay. Yeah, Eir, do you uh, agree with that assessment? Yeah, I'll put it this way. I, I have good friends who uh, support, say, this or that po point of the BDS movement or platform, uh, who so I consider to be friends. definitely not. There we go. What did you say? I said, are they some of your best friends, though? Are they some of, my, some of my best friends are BDS supporters? Um, so, but basically, to me, you know, BDS as an intellectual proposition, like Anshel said, could or could not be anti-Semitic um, on a theoretical plane. But you look at political movements in practical terms, and you look at who is involved in the political movements. You look at who is leading uh, a political movement and where they're driving the car. Before you get in the car and you fuel up the car, you have to say who's driving this thing and where do they want to go. And if you look at all of the different um, various people who are basically the chief spokesman of the BDS movement, who run the BDS movement, who are quoted in the New York Times about the BDS movement because they are the address, they don't simply want to end, say, Israel's occupation or settlements. They want to end the existence of the Jewish state. They're very open about that. Um, they say that we can never accept any Jewish state in that land. Um, and they basically want to impose a very particular solution upon both Israelis and Palestinians, um, sort of a one state, secular state, uh, solution that if you look at the polls for many, many years of Israelis and Palestinians, the one thing you can find that they overwhelmingly agree on is they do not want to be forced to live together in a single state. Um, they can agree on almost nothing else, but this and upwards of 70 for 80 percent, um, they'll tell you, we don't want to be forced to move in together. We want a divorce. Um, and so I don't believe that outside groups should be coming to a political conflict. Um, in the Middle East, especially Westerners for the most part, because the BDS movement, although there are Palestinians involved and as spokespeople, is predominantly a Western phenomenon, right? To have Westerners showing up to the Middle East and saying, we're going to redraw the borders against the will of the actual populations that live there, because we've been doing that for some time and it has never worked out well. Um, so there's on the one hand, you know, practically speaking, I think that's very damaging to the people that live there. And then as Ancho was referring to, and I've written about, I don't want to go into tremendous detail, but there are just so many people affiliate with the BDS movement who turn out not to be, you know, simply critics of Israeli policy, but people who have problems with Jews for whom this became a convenient vehicle uh, for them to express in respectable society that animus towards Jews. A very, you know, an example that was in the headlines recently uh, that I wrote about a little bit uh, was Alice Walker, the author of The Color Purple, a very, um, um, insightful author on many issues, uh, but who also in her later years particularly has become an anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist who on her own personal website was promoting uh, David Icke, the prominent conspiracy theorist who was blaming the coronavirus on the Rothschilds and the Zionists and the Jews. Uh, so much so that YouTube and Facebook finally took him off their platforms. Um, and this is somebody who obviously identifies completely with the political left, was seen for many years as an icon of the political left, signed every prominent BDS letter you can imagine, and was doing anti-Semitic stuff at the same time on her website for years, and everyone just looked away because she said, I'm just a critic of Israel. And in fact, when she was confronted about this a couple of years ago, because she recommended a horrifically anti-Semitic book by David Icke in the New York Times, and it caused a national controversy, she said, they're just coming after me because I'm a critic of Israel. Right, not because I recommended a book that said the Jews bankrolled their own Holocaust and that they control the KKK and false flag all the anti-Semitic attacks in Western countries. No, 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 it's because of my Israel politics. And Alice right. Walker is not an exception. There's Ken Livingston, the mayor of, former mayor of London, who Anshel could talk much more so about. Um, there are all these people who clearly had an issue with Jews and realized that they couldn't say that out loud. Like Anshel said, you can't do that overtly. But there is this seemingly respectable vehicle where I can just advocate boycotting the place where more than half the Jews of the world live. And that's okay, right? And so they all join up on this thing and there's no quality control in the movement. There's no unit that says, oh, it's pretty obvious that if we advocate boycotting half the world's Jews, we're gonna attract a lot of people who just hate Jews. We should probably have someone carting at the door and figuring out who these people are. The BDS movement has failed over and over again to figure that out. 
And so how can I look at this movement and say it's a, something that's simply a political thing and has nothing to do with Jews? Right. Yeah, Erin, you know, I did want to ask you actually about Alice Walker. You recently wrote, um, you know, she gave that interview to the New York Times a couple of years ago. And then earlier this month, I think she was on a podcast, um, you know, and you sort of spotlighted how uh, the New York Times didn't seem to really learn from that incident. Um, you know, do you think this was sort of like a, a slip up, an error? Is this really indicative of a bigger problem when it comes to figures like this? So I, I think with regard to Alice Walker, it was actually a very interesting and genuine error, uh, which is a few years, a couple years ago, uh, they did an interview with her in the New York Times um, in which she had recommended, as I mentioned, a viciously anti-Semitic book. And there was no note to the reader that that's what this was. I doubt they even realized that that's what she was doing because uh, it's such a weird conspiratorial track. They probably didn't recognize it and they just published it. Uh, this created a national scandal. And after that point, everyone recognized who Alice Walker was. They went back through her writings, like Anshel said, and said, oh, wow, she's posting crazy anti-Semitic stuff on her blog for years. Now, there was an element of looking away from her for those years, because it wasn't like people just discovered this. Uh, people had been writing and pointing out that she was saying and doing anti-Semitic things, um, and no one really wanted to admit it. Right, because they didn't want to believe it. It was hard, especially in progressive spaces, to admit that this person who is seen as an icon, whose book is read all over in schools, also has this darker side or has fallen into this darker element. Um, and so people just looked away until it was impossible to look away anymore. What happened more recently at the New York Times was that the, person, the people making that podcast had not seen that news cycle a couple of years ago and still had this impression in their head that she was this progressive icon. And so just invited her onto their book podcast to talk about what she's reading during the coronavirus and things like that. And they never asked her about whether she's, you know, rethought her anti-Semitic views, which would have been a thing to ask since she'd literally just posted anti-Semitic content about the coronavirus on her blog, um, right. but they didn't know that. And so as soon as that happened, they apologized. The person who ran the podcast deleted her tweets promoting the episode and said, had I realized I wouldn't have had her on. Um, and so that actually was a positive outcome. And I think it speaks to what Angel said, which is that once you get to a certain level of overt anti-Semitism, it is largely not respectable in Western countries. Uh, but the thing is, when Alice Walker was largely casting herself as just, I have extreme anti-Israel views, right? I compare what they're doing to the Holocaust. Uh, I won't let my book, The Color of Purple, which is supposed to teach tolerance, be translated into Hebrew as though Israelis are uniquely irredeemable people and therefore they couldn't be moved and changed by my book, right? People were able to excuse that sort of thing. Um, and like, it was very suggestive to Jews who looked at that and they thought that was really creepy um, that you won't let Jews read your books, right? Half the world's Jews read your book and you don't want to change them and you think they can't be saved. Um, even if you have the darkest notions of what they are. Um, so like that was acceptable. Then when she starts writing anti-Semitic poems about the Talmud and recommending crazy anti-Semitic conspiracy tracts, then that became unacceptable. But what we need to do is start recognizing that when Jews ring alarm bells about people and say, no, they're not just talking about Israel, there are clear issues with what they're talking about that go beyond that, that we should listen to them and not assume that they're just trying to, you know, I don't know, protect Israel or run some sort of interference campaign for Bibi Netanyahu, um, which is almost never the case. Right. Um, you know, one of the most prominent uh, Western figures associated with the BDS movement is Roger Waters. Um, he's, you know, long been extremely outspoken, um, you know, but he's still touring. He's still popular. Um, you know, Anshul, do you think he's sort of still seen as, you know, a, a, a fair anti israel critic? I mean, does he, is he seen as this totally irredeemable anti-Semitic figure or where do you think he falls? Well, you know, once again, it depends by whom. Some people think his uh, criticism is edgy, but still legitimate. Some people see him as being anti anti And I think uh, one of the things that's, that, that um, most of these people who we've mentioned, uh, Alice Walker, David Icke, Roger Waters, Ken Livingston, is they're also of a certain age. They're all people in their very late 60s or 70s who have... Uh, sort of achieved a certain level of celebrity before people were asking, hold on, what are your views about various things? And they feel that they're old enough and famous enough, and they have this, uh, this position that they can say these things which uh, most people won't say because they're anti-Semitic. By the way, you mentioned Alice Walker not uh, publishing her book in Hebrew. That's not entirely true. When The Color Purple came out in 1984, it was published in Hebrew, and she had no problem with it. In 2012, and you can still get it today as an e-book. E For some reason, in 2012, when uh, there was talk of a, of a new edition in Hebrew, then she said, no, because Israel's an apartheid 
the state. So through different changes, and I don't want to sound ages, but perhaps becoming rather cranky at, at a certain age. You know, Roger Waters appeared in Israel, now he wouldn't appear in Israel. So you know, all these things, I mean, I mean, I mean, go online and, and watch Roger Waters' videos. Uh, he, he, he makes little videos on Twitter, like one or two minute long. The man is unhinged. I mean, I don't, I don't know whether it's age related or what, or what it is, but the, you know, the man is not, is he, you know, he's not well. And it's probably also partly because of, of what fame does to you. And some, you know, Yair very soon is going to be so famous. He's, you know, he'll suddenly be careful as well. What, 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 what he might, might do, it, do him in, you know, careful with it, Yair. Uh, but, you know, th these are people who, you know, some of them are icons and, and their icon, iconhood has, has, gone to their, has, has gone to their head. I'm much more concerned about how you know, we deal with, not with this really rather small handful of cranks who happen to be famous because of things they've done over the past 40, 50 years, which have nothing to do with Jews or Israel or anything like that. I'm much more, I'm much more concerned about how we deal with the, you know, with the current political uh, climate in which we're using anti-Semitism or anti-Semitism or anti is coming into the discourse in various guises. And some of us, because of our partisan politics, are, are letting it in from the front door and giving it, you know, giving us a, a cash root stamp and saying, so-and-so, he can't be an anti-Semite. Look how many Chabad rabbis are in his entourage. And so-and-so can't be an anti-Semite. Look how many Jewish Marxist professors he went to uh, their, their lectures at university. So, you know, we, you know, I think that that's something we, that's much more of concern to, to us nowadays than a Roger Waters or an Alice Walker, who, okay, they have some celebrity and we can't really, uh, you know, make them uh, unacceptable in, in, in polite society because they've, you know, they've, they've accumulated celebrity, you know, in, in previous eras before uh, being anti-Semitic was just, just unacceptable. I'm much more worried about things which are much more contemporary than a Roger Water or an Alice Walker, as you know, as as problematic as the, as, as it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've talked about this hidden anti-Semitism, you know, veiled anti-Semitism. Um, you know, when you talk about Louis Farrakhan, that's someone who is, you know, maybe the, the best example of unrepentant anti-Semitism. You know, he'll get up and give a speech and say how Jews are termites. Um, but he still has some cachet among certain uh, celebrities. Um, I know Tablet wrote um, about um, Jay Electronica's new album. It was it was actually Louis Farrakhan's birthday a few days ago, and the rapper Ice Cube, you know, tweeted happy birthday to him. Um, you know, yeah, Ear, do you think like is this one of sort of the last stands where people are okay associating with this complete open naked anti-Semitism? I do think uh, Louis Farrakhan, in part, fits into what I, I shall describe, which is someone who achieves celebrity and notoriety at a particular point in his life, and that has carried that on since then, as he's got you know although he was always this extreme, uh, but it has given him a certain level of insulation and certain people who will continue to associate with him, even though uh, what he says, not just regarding Jews, right, with regarding transgender people, with regarding to gays and, uh, you know, LGBT people, um, there, there isn't a, and women, right, there isn't a, uh, a minority that, uh, that Farrakhan hasn't managed to say something horrifically offensive about. Um, it's not just unique to us. Um, I think that there, as Angel said, there's a certain generation of people who will, uh, you know, uh, pay homage to Farrakhan. Um, and then as you go down the ladder of age, Farrakhan has less and less purchase and influence. Um, and in fact, people will look at you very funny in younger African American places and say, that guy, like the crazy, nutty, cranky uncle, like you also have crazy, cranky uncles, don't you? You know, they come to your Thanksgiving meals or your Passover Seder, right? That's sort of what, what, what Farrakhan is for most of the community. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that because sometimes there's this, this element of Farrakhan says something horrifically unhinged about Jews. And then there's this mad rush to attribute that to like the broader African-American community that wants nothing to do with him anymore. Um, and that doesn't give him that sort of... Uh, um, influence or cachet. Now, that being said, because he's not actually that big a deal, uh, comparatively, say, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, in the African-American community, when you see someone of a younger age signing up to hang out with him and praising him and doing all sorts of things with him, like, say, you saw with the Women's March leaders, who are definitely not of that older generation, right? Well, that's a warning sign. That suggests something, like I said, where 
they can tell you that they're being progressive. They can say that they're, you know, that they're totally doing this all in bounds. Uh, but that's not something that most people of their generation are doing, right? You have to actively seek that out. And there's something problematic if you can't notice um, that the person you're affiliating with uh, says that, you know, Jews control Hollywood and uh, create pornography to create transgender people, right? If you can't see that you cannot partner with that person and run a progressive movement, there's something fundamentally wrong um, somewhere in your thinking or in your moral system, um, especially if you are of a younger generation. Um, and so I think we can keep those two things in mind, which is that this person is not representative, such that if you choose to associate with him, that says something more about you than almost about him. Um, you know, we've spoken about some of these more older figures, um, but, you know, we talk a lot about anti-Semitism on college campuses, um, certainly in the United States, um, in the UK as well. There's been, you know, former labor MPs who said that, you know, this is a problem on college campuses. Um, you know, how, how do you think this is playing out and how do we counter that where we're talking about really the next generation? Anshel, if you want to. Talk about anti-Semitism on Israeli college campuses. God. I've, uh, you're talking to the wrong they hate, guy. They hate the Jews the most. <laughs> I, 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 I haven't been to university a day, a day of my life, so I don't know how, how one uh, conducts oneself on a, on a, on a college campus. I can, I can tell you how, you know, about anti-Semitism in yeshivas, if you want. Uh, there's, there's a fair amount of that. <laughs> maybe that's the, maybe it's not, 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 not what, what we're here for. Um, and, you know, I'm, perhaps because I, I haven't had the experience myself, but I think that, um, Every time I do meet Jewish students, contemporary Jewish students, who are today in, in campuses, I feel that perhaps this older generation of what, what, what we call Jewish leadership, which I'm you know, not quite sure who they're leading, who, who like obsessing about what people are going in the campus, should talk a bit more to most Jewish students who feel that, they're, you know, that, that they can stick up, stand up for themselves, and maybe you... I know maybe we're obsessing too much about them. They're not. They're not as weak as uh, and and as endangered as some people uh, uh, want them to, to see them or to be. Or uh, maybe it's, maybe it's good for fundraising or something. But I don't think. I mean, the the the, the average Jewish uh, student who I meet, and I do give some talks. I, I do occasionally go to campuses to talk to to meet these people. I don't feel they're spending their, their entire time at school just uh, uh, running away from the Cossacks and you know, one step ahead of a pogrom. So I think, you know, let's, let's keep that in perspective. Let them enjoy their day, you know, those who do go to college, let them enjoy it rather than be feeling the whole time that they have to be on, on the barricades of uh, fighting uh, the neo-Nazis or, or the Israel haters, whoever it is. Right. Yeah, I mean, so until uh, this most recent uh, apocalypse, um, I would, you know, on average be on two campuses a month uh, speaking to communities of students because students read my work and they invite me to come speak. It's, it's, it was really a uh, wonderful and fulfilling experience. And of course, I would always have, you know, dinner or lunch with the students and get a sense of what the campus is like. And almost all the campuses in the United States, uh, anti-Semitism was not a live issue, uh, nor is, uh, incidentally, um, uh, the BDS movement, you know, and efforts to boycott Israel. Uh, there are hundreds of campuses, at least now, uh, we'll see after we come out of this, how many of them remain. But there are a really huge number of campuses um, in the United States. I think we pay a lot of attention to a very small subset of them, often Ivy League campuses, where I get all the headlines in the national papers. Um, but that's not where most students even are. And then you have to remember that most people don't even go to college in the United States, right? So like, go all the way down the list, the time you actually get to the campuses that are problematic, and they are, they do exist. Um, I've written about Oberlin. Uh, you guys can Google that. The New Yorker has an article on them, not just about the anti-Semitism aspects. Um, you know, there have been different things on different campuses uh, that are genuine and real um, and deserve coverage. Uh, but part of the issue here, I think, and I think Anshul is correct, that this is not the majority experience of most students, um, is that uh, journalists like myself uh, exist to cover what is new news, right? What is novel. Uh, we call those... Uh, you know, dog bites man stories, because that's news. If, sorry, a man bites a dog, that's news. A dog bites a man, it's not a, it's not a story, right? A plane crashes, that's a story. Hundreds of thousands of flights not crashing most of the time, which is miraculous and incredible, is not a story. Um, well, it's, it's so, going to be a story soon when... It's going to be for, you know, <laughs> crazy reasons, right? But for all this time, it wasn't. And by the way, if you want to read great reporting on like Anshul and on aviation, read Anshul's stuff on the Israeli aviation industry. Um, 
So like normally people just don't write about things that are not exceptional. Uh, so right. you hear about these horrific anti-Semitic incidents on campus and they are absolutely real. And you hear about the particular campuses like Oberlin that are particularly bad. And there is no like somewhere telling people that actually most of the campus, either reporter writing the piece about the anti-Semitic incident at that campus, most of the campuses I visit don't have any problems like this. And the kids tell me that. And they have very fulfilling experiences. Right. And I think we could do a better job as journalists sort of conveying the broader context of what we're doing uh, than we sometimes do. Okay. I mean, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of students I meet who come here to Israel, are not necessarily even Jewish, come here as part of programs for journalism, uh, international relations, Middle East studies, from some of the top uh, colleges in, in the States and in, in Europe. And I, I ask every group, did you have any kind of dilemma of coming here to Israel on, on, on this on this visit? And it, oh, 99% of, the, of, the, of those who I ask say, of course, we didn't have any kind of dilemma. This is uh, We may have criticism, but we're coming here because uh, it's important for us to see this place up, up, up front. And then I said, uh, do you have a, a BDS chapter or, or, or group on, on your campus? And most people say, you know, it's not, it's not a feature of our campus life. So. I think what Yara said, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a handful, it is a handful, and I think there's too much obsession about it in, in, in Jewish organizations and Jewish fundraising. I, 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 put the, I put Jewish philanthropy to much better uses of education and welfare within the Jewish communities rather than fighting this tiny handful of, of, uh, of BDSs on campus who, who have had no impact whatsoever on, on the Israeli economy or on Israel's relationships with the world, which are only improving Despite the fact that we're in uh, government here in Israel. Okay. Uh, we're going to take some Q&A from uh, the audience here. So um, let's see. For Yair, um, you know, we've talked a lot. You mentioned the Women's March, and we've also, um, you know, spoken a lot about anti-Semitism among certain younger members of Congress. Um, you know, do you think this is a growing problem? And do you think this is something, um, you know, that's going to be coming up again and again? Um, I think that in general, as uh, people figure out ways to uh, get rid of anti-Semitism or to rebut it, it comes up with new ways to, uh, to ensnare and convince people. Uh, that's how the best conspiracy theories work. They're, they're not falsifiable. Um, and so as you know, overt anti-Semitism of certain sorts becomes unacceptable, so you come up with ways to sort of sneak it in under the table. Um, again, you, like we've discussed several times, you can say, I'm simply a very strident, legitimate critic of Israel, of which, as I said, is totally fine. Um, and again, I, you know, if you've read my writings, I have some very strident criticisms of the current Israeli government. Um, but a lot of people say, oh, you know, that's a really great banner under which to smuggle all sorts of other things. So sort of the metaphor I use for people, uh, in the, say, if you're doing this in a progressive space, but it's not just true of progressive spaces, but say you're a progressive and you want to have a foreign policy that is more critical of the right-wing Israeli government. So you throw a party and you put up a big sign saying, this is you know, a critical of Israel party. We're gonna brainstorm ideas for how we're going to create this policy that's gonna be constructive and critical of what Israel is doing and trying to get things to something in more alignment with our values. Um, and people keep coming to this party and it's great. And then some people show up and they say, oh, you're, you're, you're crafting a foreign policy, um, you know, criticizing this, the home of half the world's Jews. That sounds great, I want in. And they say, yeah, sure, come on in. And those people actually were not interested so much in policies and what particularly things Israel is doing or isn't doing. Those people just had a problem with Jews. And actually they've been around much longer than the modern state of Israel, uh, which was only founded in 1948. Those people are centuries old and there are honestly many, many more of them than people who actually care about the human rights of individual Palestinians. And they show up to your party and they crash your party because nobody was carting them at the door. Um, and they don't just bring in criticisms of Israel, right? They don't just bring in say their BDS movement. They bring in their theories about the Mossad doing 9-11, right? They bring in their ideas about the Rothschild Zionists being behind the coronavirus. They bring in all sorts of other things about Jews and they start sharing them in your Facebook groups and holding up signs at your events, right? About these sorts of things and start making friends with all these people in the room and start convincing them of some of these other things. And that's how anti-Semitism seeps into progressive spaces and anti-Israel movements that might've just been about Israel when they started Right, but then all of these other people crashed the party. And because there was no quality control and no effort to figure out why they came, right, before you know it, they're all over your, your, your Facebook feeds and they're at your events. And then when people point out that they're anti-Semites, you get defensive because they're your friends, 
right? And you're saying, no, 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 he doesn't have an anti-Semitic bone in his body. Um, I can't explain those memes that he's posting on his Facebook page and the signs he held up at the event and the interview he gave to that reporter, right? But it can't be because he's part of our team, right? And then people start being selective about which anti-Semites they care about. Um, and that's sort of how it happens. And I just described it in a progressive space. But of course, you can see it in the same phenomenon, whereas they came to our Trump rally and they said they just care about individual rights and states' rights, right? And the government should get out of our business. But it also turns out the reason they want the government out of their business is so they can be discriminatory towards racial and sexual minorities. Um, and nobody asked them about exactly why they showed up. And soon enough, they're running the party, right? And so you need to be able to actually, I think in Jewish communities need to think about this too say we're running a pro-Israel organization and people show up and say, yeah, I'm really pro-Israel and I'm very upset about Palestinian terrorism. Now, does it have something to do with, you know, a considered understanding of the situation, right? Or is it because they just don't like Muslims, right? I am critical of Ilan Omar. Are you critical of her because of her very extreme stances on Israel? Or are you critical of her because she's a very prominent Muslim woman of color with power and you resent that, right? And we need to card at the door and figure out who we're accepting as allies and who we're not to make sure that we're not accepting these sorts of people and they're not infecting our causes. Okay. A uh, viewer question for Anshel. Anshel, are you still with us? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the Labour Party in England just elected a new leader, um, you know, ousting Corbyn, who was a figure who was seen by the majority of British Jews as anti-Semitic. Um, you know, do you think the Labour Party is returning to, you know, uh, a more palatable party for Jews? Do you think that this change is uh, on its way? I think change is uh, the, the moment that Corbyn uh, lost the election back in December and he doesn't lose the election. He was resoundingly uh, 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 beaten and rejected by, you know, as, as no other Labour leader had in, in living memory since the 1930s. I think that in itself uh, made it very clear that the, the group which had opened, which had taken Labour over uh, five years ago when Corbyn uh, was elected as leader for the first time, had was totally discredited, it didn't, didn't uh, uh, reflect British society, it didn't reflect left wing of British society, it reflected a, a very small uh, entryist uh, margin, which had managed to, you know, to bring in a lot of people as party members and take over the party for a, short, for a certain period. But that period could only last as long as uh, as Corbyn could make this myth that he that he could ever become prime minister. It was a myth, and it was you know, it was blown out of the water. And I think from the moment that that happened, and it was clear that Corbyn was going to leave, I think the British Labour Party began making its way back to the to the mainstream. And Keir Starmer is certainly a mainstream leader. You know, he's a left winger. He believes in, in human rights. He's also a human rights lawyer. But nobody's ever had any suspicion or or feeling from him of any kind of anti-semitism i ha i hesitate to say that he's married to a jewish woman but that's perhaps you know we, we've, we've learned recently that that's no uh, guarantee having a jewish uh, spouse or a jewish child or grandchildren certainly not guarantees that, that you're not tainted yourself but uh, i think it's very clear that care for uh, Keir Starmer from the moment he uh, he launched his leadership campaign certainly from the moment he won uh, he's gauged with the mainstream of the, of the Jewish community in a very, in a very serious way. He's got some shit uh, from from the left for doing so. They, you know, they're attacking him for uh, for kowtowing to the board of deputies and so on. But I think that uh, uh, he, you know, it's pretty clear that he's he's, he's repositioned Labour as a party which can certainly be a friendly place for Jews. That, that doesn't change the fact that there are still of the many local uh, constituency branch, uh, branches across the country, there are still places where there are radical left-wingers who have made that specific little branch in some town or neighborhood their own place. And, and it is difficult for Jews to be there. That, that, that will remain uh, a fact of life. And also Keir Starmer will have to continue to accommodate at least some of the Corbynists, perhaps not the mo more hardcore of them, but they are part of what is a very broad left-wing party. So there is the right. more hardcore left. Uh, and there'll be some criticism from some of the, some of the Jewish community that Keir Starmer hasn't gone far enough and hasn't gone fast enough to eradicate the Corbynists. I don't think he can eradicate the Corbynists because some of them are real Labour members and not all the Corbynists are anti-Semites. Um, but I think by and large, he's very quickly, very, uh, 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 very, very authentic way, I think, 
position the party back in the mainstream as a, pla a place where Jews could be. I know that a lot of Jewish friends who used to be Labour members are traumatized by what happened last time, and they won't rush back to be members or won't rush back to vote necessarily, but the election probably won't take Britain. So I think Kirsten has got the time, has already done the right, the, the first good steps to, to reposition the party. And you know, so many things are happening now in politics in the West and in Britain, certainly, which we didn't expect just two or three months ago because of the pandemic. And it's given him also an opportunity to show that he's a, he's a very serious politician, probably much more serious than the current prime minister of Britain. So I think uh, people will, uh, will sit up and listen to him. Also, when he purges the party around his empathism, as he is already doing now. Okay, well, thank you to both of you. I'm going to pose one last question before we wrap it up. Same to each of you, which is tell us uh, a book, a movie, a TV series that you, uh, you know, found during lockdown that you enjoyed that you can recommend. So, uh, Eric, start with you. This is a good question. Um, uh, I've actually rediscovered uh, computer games. Uh, which is something that I used to do much more so when I was younger uh, and is actually quite enjoyable now. There is a computer game called Slay the Spire, which is sort of a strategy card game um, in which you climb a tower and defeat all sorts of enemies and build new strategies as you go, um, which I highly recommend. Um, well worth your time, uh, engages your brain, actually can be played at a very high level. Um, I do actually want to choose, if I can, just pull one question out of the Q&A. There are some really good comments in the Q&A. Um, and I wanted to mention one of them. Somebody asked, and when we talked about the fact that we can go through people's social media histories and they can reveal to us who they really are versus who they present themselves as, and that's extremely valuable. Uh, but the person asked, what if they've stopped making those comments after a certain amount of time? And perhaps they were the re result of ignorance. Um, and at what point do we you know, sort of let people move on from those sorts of things? Um, and I do think people have to account for that sort of thing in their past. Uh, but I actually, it's something I try to stress to audiences when I address these topics, and I think it's relevant uh, to the creative community for peace, which deals with all sorts of, you know, flare-ups in the arts world where things, you have to decide, how do we go, you know, approach this person who said something that we consider um, problematic towards Jews, right? Do we think that they hold deliberate prejudice and hatred that can't be changed in their heart towards Jews? Or are they re repeating things they've heard or act out of ignorance because Jews are only 2% of the American population and they only have a contact with a very limited set of them? Um, and I think we need to be cognizant that uh, people shouldn't be in always uh, um, sort of branded with their worst tweet ever, especially if it's something from, you know, like 5, 10, 20 years ago. Um, some of the most impressive, say, interfaith advocates and educators on anti-Semitism I've met started out as anti-Semites, right? Because they didn't know any better and their cultures they grew up in had a bunch of anti-Semitic assumptions um, and they were handed anti-Semitic material to read. Um, and then they met real Jews and they changed. And that makes them some of the most effective people to educate others about this. But if you had an iPhone back then and could have filmed that person holding anti-Semitic signs up um, at a rally when he was a teenager, would he ever have been able to become the imam that educates people on anti-Semitism now? Probably not, right? Because that would be the first Google search result and everyone would be like, well, maybe he's legitimate now, but like, I don't really want to associate with him, right? And I think if you recognize that there's a difference between being an anti-Semite and saying an anti-Semitic thing and speaking out of ignorance versus speaking out of sort of a hard conspiratorial, like Alice Walker, repeatedly sharing this material over and over, despite being educated, confronted, and asked about it over and over, right? And many people who might be, you know, in their teens tweeting stuff stereotypically about all sorts of groups, right? We've all been there, we all were that, and we should treat those people with the same charity we'd expect, right? And then, of course, reevaluate to see if they grow uh, in their perceptions. And I think that that's something, of course, that what I like about Creative Community for Peace is that it doesn't exist to come down like a hammer on people when they screw up. It sort of exists to guide the conversation in a positive direction. Okay. Ancha, we'll give you the last word if there's a... Uh, you asked uh, you know, what we've been uh, watching or reading in uh, yeah. lockdown. I, I had a period of a few years in which I couldn't read biographies because I was writing a biography myself and I felt every time I was reading someone else's biography, either I was only seeing the flaws in it or I was seeing this is so great, no way I'll ever write uh, myself so what is so good. So, I, so and it used to be my favorite kind of book and for a few years I could for a few years I literally couldn't read a, another biography but thankfully one of the good things that happened to me in the shutdown is I managed to get back to reading biographies and the, probably the best one I read was uh, Stalin, the Court of the Red Tsar by Simon Seabag Montefiore, 
and it's, it's very much connected to the subject we're talking about now because in in the book simon simon gets into all the questions of the of the rela personal relationship stalin had over his years as the leader of the soviet union and many of his closest allies were jews and at the same time he he was the man who traded some of the worst anti-semitic purges certainly after the second world war and basically he's the man who built the, this, this false equivalent of Zionism, of anti, we're not anti-Semitic, we're anti-Zionist, which is something he, he basically invented in the early 1950s. And it's fascinating to see how he at the same time used anti-Semitism as a, as a political tool while having Jewish allies and having so many Jews uh, support and protect him and sort of say, no, he's not anti-Semitic, it's part of his, of his communist ideology to be against the landlords or be against the Zionists and so on. So it, it, it was a real eye opener reading that book, and happy I'm happy to be read, reading biographies again, and I hope other, others will also start reading biographies. As well. There's a good one behind me that you may want to buy. You should you should all read Anshul's uh, biography of uh, Netanyahu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is excellent. Well, okay. I, well, thank you. Go yeah, ahead. I want to thank uh, both of you guys, Yair and Anshul, for joining us today. Uh, their insight uh, has been great. Amy, thank you so much for moderating. Uh, this is a topic where people clearly have strong feelings, and it's a serious issue that the world has yet to find a solution to after hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, the numbers I mentioned at the beginning of the discussion once again speak for themselves and are concerning, obviously, uh, especially as it starts to manifest itself on places like college campuses. Um, and this is also why the safety of the state of Israel is so important to, to, to many of us. Uh, so when we say never again, it's because the state of Israel exists as that home of the Jewish people that gives us some comfort in knowing never again is uh, not just some mere words. Uh, once again, Creative Community for Peace is, is an apolitical organization and we are a nonprofit entertainment industry organization working to build bridges through the arts while working to counter anti-Semitism within the entertainment industry. In addition to countering the culture boycott of Israel, uh, we rely on donations to do our work. So please visit ccfpeace.com. Once again, ccfpeace.com. Uh, you can also sign up for our email list there, and if you do, uh, and please stay connected as we have a lot more panel discussions coming. Uh, we'll also have links to previous panel discussions on our Facebook page. I uh, hope to see everyone uh, soon. Uh, everyone, please stay safe, and thank you so much.